You're going to hear a lot about Docker yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So I don't want to talk about Docker. Um, but I want to put Docker and that class of containers into context. Uh, and so to do that, I'm going to talk about all of the classes of containers, and then I'm going to dive into the one that I'm particularly interested in at the moment. And the one thing I want to say up front is, all of these containers are super useful. Um, it's a bit like if, if you're a, kind of a workshop kind of guy, you're going to have a hammer, hammer and a mallet, and they sort of look the same, but you use them for different purposes. And so um, all of these should be in your tool chest. Right. Containers are essentially a new way of organizing stuff that's running on a machine. And when you get under the hood, you understand that in the Linux kernel, there is no such thing as the list of containers. It doesn't exist. The kernel has no idea about a Docker container or a LexD container or a Snap container. The kernel is actually tracking things at a much lower level. And what it's really what it's really tracking is the illusion that it wants to create for a particular process, right? So for a particular process, I can create the illusion that it has other processes next to it, or I can create the illusion that it's all by itself. I can create the illusion that it's sharing a disk with some other processes, or I can create the illusion that when it asks about the disks, it sees a disk that only it sees, right? And we can essentially get the kernel to tell these, to create these illusions about all sorts of things, about the users that that, that process has access to, about the network interfaces, about the disks, about other processes. And so these kinds of containers that are emerging, of which Docker, the process container is the most famous, really these are sort of classes of illusion that you might want to create for different purposes. Okay. So how did, we, how did I get to be interested in all of this stuff? Well, I lead a lot of the work at Ubuntu. Ubuntu continues to just roar up the charts as the platform that people use to innovate. Uh, and that's what I love, that's what I care about. I care about people who are innovating. So we have to be thinking about the stuff that's coming down the pike long before anybody else has got there. The stuff that I think is super interesting these days is this combination of Elasticity in some parts of the world, whether that's a public cloud or a private cloud, or whether you want to just operate your bare metal in an elastic kind of way, right? There's all this stuff happening around elastic operations. And I call that the hybrid cloud world because ultimately you've got to be able to do all of the things that are interesting elastically on your own premises, on your own hardware, and on public clouds, and all of those things at the same time. And that's really where the world of Docker is, that's the Mesosphere, Kubernetes, it's all in that sort of elastic domain. But I'm also really interested at what we call the, in, in what we call the edge. Now, the cloud stuff, we, we really invested in that five, six, seven years ago. Now, very much, I'm interested in the edge. So. We look at what the, 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 the kind of crazy smart people are doing, and the crazy smart people these days are carrying around little edgy type devices, starting with the Raspberry Pi, but now there's a gazillion others. Um, Intel just launched some really brilliant developer boards for their range of IoT. And I'm, I'm interested in this explosion of stuff that we can now treat as a place you could put software, right? And that's very interesting. You know, we've had electronics around for ages, but you never thought of it that as a place you could put software, like the, the heating control thing on the wall. You never thought of that as a place you could put your app, right? But the next generation of all of this is software-defined. In fact, the next generation of all the business models for all of this is software-defined, right? And that's super interesting. Okay. So, blah, blah, blah. So here's another interesting thing. The cost of licensing software is plummeting. The average cost of a software license is headed to zero because of open source. And yet, the cost of doing software continues to climb. Right? This is very, very real. So we have to really think about operations. And that's, again, where containers play. Right? The whole container story is all about operating software, new ways to operate software. Okay, so let's talk about how you operate software. This is a traditional machine. When you boot up your brand new CentOS, your brand new Debian, your brand new Ubuntu, there's a bunch of stuff running. 
And that stuff running is kind of all doing all the housekeeping. housekeeping. In a city, like that's what the mayor does, right? It's taking out the trash, it's making sure that there are police, it's making sure that the, the, the streets signs are, are painted, all of that sort of stuff, right? And they perform a very essential function. That's just like the hygiene of that environment. And when you operate that, you add an application, you basically install that on the machine right there. And so that process is expecting all of these other things around it. How do I operate this the old-fashioned way, right? I just go there and I do stuff, right? And then along came virtual machines, KVM and, the, and, and ESX. And the nice thing about virtual machines is that they feel exactly the same as physical machines. All of those processes are running. All of the hygiene is there. My logs are getting rotated. Cron is running. All of the things that my application process would expect. So I operate that just like a machine. No real change, right? So the first step into containers, and people, I think, often forget this, the first step actually is to what we call machine containers. And in all the excitement around Docker, which is super important, I think people have perhaps forgotten that actually most organizations, most workloads, most applications, the natural first step into containers is as a machine container. Because in a machine container, you have all of that hygiene stuff running there. How do you operate that? Well, you operate it traditionally, right? So you install an application there. That application thinks it's running on CentOS. It thinks it's running on Debian, but it's running at the speed of a container. And I can scale it and make it dense, just like I can make any other kind of container, but it still feels like a VM. Now, that's not cool for new applications, but it's very, very cool for the rest of the applications. Uh, in a banking environment, 20% of your applications will get rewritten or obsoleted in 10 years. 80% won't. So this is for that 80%, right? Your first step, traditional operations into VMs, traditional operations into LexD. And uh, I'll, show you, I'll show you just what that feels like if you haven't seen it. Um, there's a machine running. Go make another machine. There it is. And if I do that again, it's got an IP address. It'll DHCP. So I'm going to hop into it. And when I do PSAX, because this is a machine container, all the hygiene's there, all the services are there, right? It's just a machine. It's just like a VM. So don't forget about those. My colleague Dustin, I think, is going to speak in more detail about that. So I'm going to keep, keep going. Okay, so then along came Docker with this brilliant stroke of insight, which is to say, look, in many cases, we just want the process. We just want the, the thing that we care about, right? Just that. And we can get even denser if we can get rid of those other things. But there's work to be done, right? And so that's what everybody's wrapping their heads around now. And the real issue here is you don't operate that traditionally. All of the talks we've had here today have sort of validated that. Stateless is hard. You've got to think about it. There's new tools getting done. And that stuff is super important. This is a new class of matter like plasma, right? It's a new state of matter. This is a new class of, of way of organizing software. And we're going to do tons of interesting stuff with that. On Ubuntu, Mesos, Kubernetes, Docker Engine, and Swarm, those are all first class things. We love those, support those and work with people who are doing them at scale. Um, but there's enough said about them, right? I don't think I can add to what's being said there. The pioneers there are clearly Docker, clearly Mesosphere, clearly the Google guys with Kubernetes, um, uh, and so on. All right, what I want to talk about now, though, is what if apt get the packaging system for the host? I want to come back to the host. What if that and Docker had a baby? Right. What are, what, what's great about Docker? What's great about Docker is that sense of immediate transactionality. Right. When I say Docker run MySQL, I get one of those processes, and it's, it's just that process. And the bits are signed. The bits are immutable. The bits are exactly what the developer published as that set. That, that crispness is kind of fantastic. By contrast, when we're operating this stuff down here, it's very mushy, 
right? The old way of operating on a file system is very mushy. You, you're kind of editing stuff all the time. You don't know what somebody else edited just before you. It's kind of mushy, right? So what do we want? We want that crispness, that instant, instantaneous certainty, that immutability, but we want it to be part of the base system. So what's, what do we don't want from Docker in this case? Docker is beautiful and Mesosphere is beautiful, right? But what do we not want in this case, right? We don't want that idea of there's another IP address. When I say Docker run my SQL, yes, I've got my SQL, but I don't have it here, right? I've got it at another IP address and I've got to go there to use it. Whereas if I'm making a robot, right, or a, or a desk phone, I want an application here where I am, right? So that's what a snap is. A snap has its own immutable disk in the same way that Docker has its own immutable entire file system, right? But this is just a disk containing the application. The application, the illusion that we create for this process, right? That's the app. The illusion that we create for this process is a more interesting hybrid illusion. When it says, tell me about my disk, it says, it gets told you have two disks. This one that you can write to, actually a couple of disks, there's your immutable stuff, which is your binaries, your libraries, your content, what the developer made and, z and zipped up and signed. And then your writable disk, effectively, also over here, that only you can write to. So we have that same crispness, right? That thing can't pollute the rest of the system. That thing is in its own box, in its own place. But it also sees slash. It also sees the host disk. And that allows us to do a lot of really useful traditional things for getting software to talk together, right? So what, is, what does that feel like? So um, come out of that container. Um, if I say, Um, let me start again. Okay, those are the, some snaps installed on the system. Um, Redis is not there, right? But if I say, uh, now, I built this locally on a flight. So I have to say it's unsigned. to know its file name. And I have to remember my password. Okay. That felt like apt-get, right? I installed a package. And if I... ask what packages are installed, I'll see Redis. And if I type... Redis, you'll see all of the Redis commands are now on my system. So what do I not have? I don't have that magic elasticity that Docker gives you, right? I can't just say, give me another Redis and another Redis and another Redis and have five of them running all with their own IP addresses. If I wanted that, I'd use that hammer, right? If I wanted that experience, if I want that, that beautiful elasticity of Docker or RunC or Rocket, then I would use that and I get more processes with more IP addresses, which is nice if I want elasticity. That's a sort of like a, a greasing, a separation between the process and the actual machine. I don't care so much if I've got 20 machines, which machine is hosting that process. But when I've only got one machine, when I've got a robot or a self-driving car or a Wi-Fi access point or a Raspberry Pi, I don't want 25 Redis processes. I want, to know, I want an app on that and I want it precise. So what does it feel like? So, so that, that's a snap that I built. So I had to say basically use it locally and so on and so forth. But what if I go to a machine? Um, uh, let me just check my networks up. Okay, so this is a brand new uh, machine that I just, uh, well, I'll do it on this one. I'll do it here. 
I want to install something. Who's played with Rocket Chat? Who's played with Slack? Would you like an open source Slack? It's very cool. So some nice Brazilian guys uh, making a really cool open source Slack equivalent. And you can install it on any system with one command. So what's going on? First, so this is, this is a brand new system, so it's never had any snaps installed. First, we're downloading a snap, which is quite a large snap. That's actually the entire base Ubuntu operating system. So we put the entire base operating system into a snap. That's the core snap. And then we're going to download Rocket Chat. And Rocket Chat is totally encapsulated. So all of the Node.js, all of the many, many, many libraries and codes and bits and pieces that they, that they use are totally encapsulated in that big file. That's very much like Docker, right? That feels very much like Docker. But this is going to be running locally on that system, right? So I can't use this to just magically create five of them with their own IP addresses. If I wanted that, I'd use Docker. But I can use them to create an app on this system very, very easily. So there we're done, right? And so if I, uh, there I now have a single snap installed. The next one is a little bit faster because we've already got the base system effectively. Um, you see, if you snap list, you see the Ubuntu core snap. Now, the reason the Ubuntu core snap is interesting is because this allows us to, ha to have that same snap, that Rocket Chat server snap, work on Debian, work on CentOS, work on Fedora, work on OpenWRT on your home router, work on any Linux. Why? Because the Rocket Chat server, when it looks at its base file system, is seeing mostly that. And so that's very interesting, effectively. We now have portability like we have with Docker. It's not for elasticity. We don't have elasticity. But we have portability. We can actually get these things onto lots of devices. So for example, top of rack switches. There are lots of telcos playing with open top of rack switches. And Quagga and Snaproot Snaproot D and a bunch of telco networking equipment stuff, apps, are becoming snaps so that they can work on all of those top of rack switches. On a top of rack switch, I don't want five redises, but I might want one to drive the stuff on that top of rack switch. So digging in a little further, um, what does that snap actually look like? So if I do What have we actually done? We've mounted the snap as a file system. So if I look at what's mounted, you'll see over here, each of those snaps is actually a mount point. And that's what makes it transactional, right? That's what gives it that finality. If there's a new version of that snap, I can download the new version of the snap, and it is literally an unmount and a remount, which is on a file system in the Linux kernel, atomic. So I have a very high level of precision in that swap out, essentially, between the old software and the new software. I also keep the old software around. So, so just like the sort of Netflix style of upgrade, roll back, I have the old software around. And the writable disks for those snaps are backed up every time we do that. So I have apps that I can install on a device but I've got amazing transactionality, not just of the binaries, but also of the persistent state. So think about that. You, you want to put apps on your top of rack switch, but if you lose a top of rack switch, you lose the whole rack. So as these edge devices become more and more software defined, as they also become more security critical, the biggest botnets on the world, in the world today, are Linux DDoS botnets that are taking control of home routers, Linux home <coughs> routers. This will solve that problem because it essentially allows us to dynamically upgrade and roll back the software invisibly in the background of those routers with everything signed. The NSA can't tamper with it, and botnets can't tamper with it. Um, what else? What's it like to make a snap? So this is, I showed you that I was playing with a Redis snap. 
Um, this is the source code for that Redis snap. Well, it's the metadata effectively. So you can ignore the um, descriptions at the top. But basically, that's it. That's the entire thing. All it's saying is basically, um, go and fetch Redis from Git, and then build it using a particular prefix. And then there's some code that I wrote here, which is essentially just like an init script effectively. It will be invoked at when, the, when the daemon's installed. And, and I need that because I've said that up here, there's a set of commands, there's a set of apps that will be installed on the system, right? So this is very much a much higher level, much cleaner kind of package than we've ever had in the past. Packaging for traditional Linux is really, really complex because you've got all of these interdependencies and interlocking things to have to deal with. Now, we can essentially isolate pieces. So whatever you do in your box, we don't care. All we care about is the pieces you want to expose to the rest of the system. So this is super interesting. For example, a lot of banks use golden images, right? They essentially say, we'll, we'll, we'll make a golden image of all the software that we care about, and then we'll distribute that, and everybody will use that, and then they'll all get the software. But the problem with that is, you now have this big interlock problem where to get something quick and fast done, you've got to go through all the same processes to get onto the golden image that the very serious security stuff has to go through. Well, here, we can tease that stuff apart. Each of those pieces becomes a snap. It's signed, it's immutable, we know exactly what version it is, we can roll it back, and where there's interlock, we can essentially bundle inside the snap. Okay, hopefully that's useful, hopefully that's fun, hopefully I haven't distracted too much from all, from all of the Docker enthusiasm and excitement and the great big dueling contest as to how on earth to orchestrate those things. It will all get solved, but it will take a little bit of time. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.